We know nothing about what he's got. It's something to do with the brain, obviously, he says. So one thing I can tell you, you must not, as most couples like you who have Swedish and English, you must not speak two languages. The brain couldn't take it in, you must choose just one language. So I had to go to university and learn Swedish. <laughs> like most English people, living, you know, meeting people who are not your own mother tongue, they usually say, well, you speak such good English, why should I speak your... But that's not true. I can advise you all to speak a language, foreign language, it gives you so much value systems and everything to do with cultures. I was lucky because in those days when I had unders, I was both an international journalist traveling the world. I was working in 25 countries at that time, those 25 countries that are there. You probably can't read it, but there are lots of countries. I was working in them. And I was also, I'd also started a company called Managing Cross-Cultural Relations. Because I realized that when people met people from other countries, there's a lot of, especially I was working in the business world, and I was working with both parent companies who had lots of subsidiaries. And that meant that there was so much misunderstanding I could understand when I spoke to the subsidiaries, they didn't understand the Swedish parent companies at all. And the Swedes didn't understand their subsidiary companies. So I went round the world with my clients um, giving workshops. And during that time, I was so lucky, I then had the contact with both, well, part of my clients were both Pharmacia, which was Swedish at the time, a Swedish uh, pharmaceutical, and Astra, which was also Swedish. Pharmacia from the start, when they knew we were trying to get a diagnosis, what do we do? And they thought, they realized that if a chemical company, whichever one it was, who could find a medical solution for obesity, which we realized it was, uh, would make packets of money. So both Pharmacia and Astra uh, agreed to support anything we wanted to do to try and find what it was that was making this child a beast. So it was very lucky. Pharmacia became Pfizer, merged with Pfizer, who I think still supports us in our, some of our research, and Astra um, merged with Zeneca in England. So we've been very lucky with all those things, thanks to our job there. So being in limbo, not knowing what to do, what do you do? What would you all do? What would it be like not knowing? And in the end, when Anders was 14 years old, he'd been to school in Sweden, a normal school, loved it. He was being very bullied. He didn't notice it himself. I could, I would go and sort of spy on him in spare time. And I saw that he was being asked to run, and they were all clapping and saying, faster, faster. And I thought, my God. But then I heard others say, Mum, why is it that when the teacher leaves the room, they all choose to, to throw their pencils at me? And why is it all not be running? And he was so proud of them being chosen to have pencils thrown at him. And I thought, I've got to change my value systems. You can't just think the way you usually think. Anyway, um, after that normal school in Sweden, we didn't know what to do with him, because you have to, after the age of 14, go to different schools. That would not work in Sweden. So we sat and had a talk about it. And I just said, Mum, why don't I do what you did? Go to boarding school. We looked at each other and thought, what a wonderful idea, get rid of him. Oh, you'll be free and you'll be free. But anyway, they, they discovered there were no boarding schools in Sweden at that time. Whether there are now, I don't know. So, Anders said, why don't I go to your country? You not straight to school in England. He said, you don't speak any English. And he said, what does that matter? He also, at the age of eight, uh, you know, they have a bad muscle. Right. 
At the age of eight, I don't remember why, but he decided he wanted to do judo. From the age of eight, he's done judo all his life. Absolutely loves it. Maybe it's the closeness he gets to people, I don't know. But he makes me petrified because she's throwing people on the floor and he's been thrown on the floor. You think he's got bad back and he's always hurting, but he just loved it. And it certainly was good for his muscles. So I'd advise you, maybe, to suggest that your children, the PBS, would like to do judo. <laughs> very good for the muscle system, very good for everything in the body, and for touching and for getting on with people. <laughs> he went to England to boarding school, as I said. And I think he'd been there about two months or three months when an under-doctor at St. Huron's called me and said, please come to us quickly, quickly. I've just read an article in The Lancet by Dr. Lawrence. The Lancet, most of you, I expect, know is a medical journal, internationally read, written in England. And uh, Dr. Lawrence was an English doctor. As Anders was at school, in England, I, of course, I don't remember how we had no computers in those days, which wasn't easy to get in touch with people. We had no faxes either in those days. So it was a telephone, that's all. Home telephone, no mobiles. So just imagine trying to, how do you find people? How do you find with Dr. Prada and the others? Anyhow, this was called Prada Williams Syndrome, and it was uh, invented in 1956 by Dr. Prada, Dr. Lin, Linda Lindbod? Lamoth. Lamoth, Dr. That's right, Lamoth and Dr. Willie. Willie. No, the three of them. Yeah. Oh. Dr. Prada, Dr. Willie, and Dr. Lamoth, that's right, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you Yes, so um, they anyhow, um, I, um, when I finally uh, got to England, I found Dr. Lawrence, I can't remember how, he confirmed Anders' um, Anders' uh, diagnosis, and um, I told him, Dr. Prada, that he got a new syndrome, and now he knew what he was. I also told him it was Dr. Prada, Prada Woody syndrome, and I suggested you should tell all his mates so they would know that he had a diagnosis. It wasn't necessarily a very good idea. As those of you who have English as a mother tongue know why, Dr. Prada and Dr. Willy. Um, it wasn't so easy. He told me I didn't know that myself because I'd lived most of my life in Sweden and in France. And lived very little in England at the time. Anyway, um, when I just had been in England about three months, I, I kept going over to make certain he was okay and meeting the headmaster. The headmaster said to me, You told me your son didn't speak English. And I said, not a word. And he said, well, you're right, he doesn't speak English, but he understands every word we say, especially when we talk about him. <laughs> <laughs> so again, I would advise you all that I think that those with Prada Willie, uh, they do have very special brains, a lot that we don't make good of. And languages, learning languages, is a very, very good thing. Because they've got, well, many of them, I think probably those with, I don't know, one sitting one deletion or not the other, have very good memories, excellent memories. And to learn a language, you need memories. Okay? So, what happened about finding out more about Prodway? I don't remember how, but I met Dr. Prodway in Switzerland and told him that the first thing I did, by the way, was of course in Sweden, living in Sweden, I started it. I met, I, that's right, I went to Karolinska Hospital, where I met this wonderful doctor, Martin Ritzen, some of you will know, I think. Sorry, he's not here today. Um, he's still going with it, well. Um, Karolinska Institute is also very well known internationally. So they started trying to find out more. And I was called, as I said about this, um, to, to find out if more about it from England. Um, when I was in England, uh, there was many, uh, just I think what it, what it was that was telling me then, 
that I'd got to start. But I was travelling all the time in my 25 countries. Um, I always got Martin Ritzen very kindly, always wrote to um, one of his colleagues in the country I was in to find out do they know about fraud already? Really? Have they got the diagnosis of that country? We've never heard of it in Sweden or in England at the time. And nowhere that I found in Europe. And um, that was fascinating because uh, first of all we started when I, when I was, um, took Anders to meet Dr. Ritzen in Karolinska. Um, I remember clearly that I said to, are there any others in Sweden? Is he alone in Sweden? Because I know he wants to meet others. We all love to meet others. Um, and Martin Ripsen said to me, and I heard, I heard, I heard this, Doctor, sorry, can you hear me? Yep. Good, even at the back. <laughs> um, Doctor, um, Doctor Lindblad, who said about languages, was, as I said, so wrong. But, um, when I was told that, that, um, that of course, yes, he said, I have just, I, uh, he told me in England that Martin Ritzen existed, I didn't know he existed, and that he had just diagnosed four broderies. I couldn't believe it, so I rushed back to Sweden, where Atlas was, and um, saw Dr. Ritzen for the first time, and asked him, please, uh, give me the names of those four, because I'm sure they all want to meet up, but nobody's met. And he said, Jean, didn't tell them what it was down the other, probably not. Um, you probably, as you're not English, you probably don't know the name, but there's a word we have in Sweden, uh, which means that you, as a doctor, you're never allowed to pass on telephone numbers or names of patients. And I said to him, look, if you have had 14 years, 14 years in limbo, surely you would want to meet. And we just, we had a nice conversation together and we agreed that he would write a, we wrote a letter together to those five or four. Um, I didn't know who they were, but I signed the letter inviting them to my home, uh, which was, a, I think it was May the 14th, uh, 19, I believe it was now. 1985, that's right, because I found out 84. Mm -hmm. By 85, a year later, we managed to get these five uh, Swedish parents together, and we all said the same thing. We longed to meet each other, but we were scared. Maybe it was worse than we thought. If we wanted to. I remember I had the phone number of one of them. I phoned them, and then I put the phone down. I didn't dare. <laughs> Um, but anyhow, waiting that time, I remember waiting with my husband, who was very Swedish. That means you don't show your feelings very much, you keep them to yourself. I remember seeing tears pouring down his face because as we were waiting for those four others. And knowing the Swedish people were rather reserved. I didn't have the phone numbers, I wrote to them all and I sent the form. I am coming, yes, no with my husband, or wife was going to be, and with my son or daughter with probably, yes, no, a form to fill in. And they all chose to fill in the form rather than phone me. I did do, leave my number. That was typical too. So waiting that day for the five to come with their probably sons and daughters, and I saw my husband tears pouring down his face. It was the most incredible waiting all those years, and then suddenly discovering that other people have got the same. And when we met, we realised we had nothing in common, but everything in common. And that is what happens with people, parents, and anybody dealing with Prada or any other probably uh, not known syndrome. That you might have nothing in common unless you had met, then you've suddenly got everything in common, absolutely everything. So we realised we must start a Swedish association, that's what we did first. And then we started the Swedish Association in 86, wasn't it? Yes. 86, yes. And then it went on Sweden, it's too small a country. 
with a language that nobody speaks except the Swedes. We must go international. We must go international. They told me they had, right near their hospital, a father who had just come. And they just diagnosed his son. So I met Henk Mussela. Some of you who are Dutch here might know Henk Mussela. I don't think he's with us any longer, unfortunately. In fact, I know he's not. But he and I, again, had everything in common. We had a son each. And so we decided, and what to do from Sweden, really. But I realized Sweden was a bit outside for everybody coming from wherever they were coming. So we decided Holland. And that's when the first conference was held in 1991. And all those 22 countries that are written there, what they've written is, you can't see it, I can't see it either. <laughs> <laughs> it says it is undersigned on behalf of the member organisations of the International Prodi Winnie Syndrome Organisation wish to express their humble thanks, or heartfelt, heartfelt thanks to me for founding it so and for work in in the forthcoming something, I can't read either. Anyhow, here you've got 22 countries with us from the stock. They all came. Yeah. What? To land your See that with you. Yeah. Okay. Um, that was Dr. Prada was fantastic. He came to our first conference and our second. That one is the second. First one, as I said, was Holland, and the second was Norway. And there we had. Um, Folk dancing, Norwegian folk dancing. Any Norwegians here? I think there are, there we are. Thank you very much, well, there we are. Um, did, you, did you come to that no, meeting? Did you come to that meeting? 1995 it was. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. You that a minute. Anyway, the second one was in Norway, and we had to put it off in a year went wrong, I know that, because I know it was meant to have it and then suddenly they couldn't get the funding. So it was changed. All that when you don't have taxes and computers wasn't easy, I can promise you. It took a whole year to redo. And that was more. And I said, we're all doing folk dancing. Um, and I said, do you know something I would recommend? Dr. Prada, at the first conference, I remember him saying, I have learned more from the parents than I've learned in the years of research I've been doing. Because he came to that first conference, he came to the second conference, and he had diagnosis, his diagnosis was published. I, I was not published, I don't know, no, I don't know, well, it wasn't published properly. But 1956 was when he discovered it, when it was registered by so. Anyway. So, what I'd love to say to you all is that I'm so proud to see this. These are all my babies. <laughs> Somehow, it's all come back, and I'm delighted that you're all here. And I really hope you'll have a lovely life. I'm sure you'll have nothing so positive as to work with Prodigy and have a whole big family. Thank you. Very much.